you said to Clark, there's quite an echo on this point, so you'll have to bear with me. It's very echoing. Sounds like I'm in a concert, I'm sure we'll, we'll battle for it. Welcome to this, the final uh, meeting with the Environment Overview and Screening Committee of this municipal year. Uh, my name is Philip Brent, I'm the chair of this meeting, I'll try and steer us to the agenda as is shown on the agenda paper. Um, to my left are committee officers and also a cabinet member, and to my right are more committee officers and our solicitor. Chair, thank you. Is that, is that, is that echoey as well? Yeah, we're not. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I'm sure um, the majority of this won't be news now, considering it's been all over the national media, but I thought it would be really useful uh, to update this committee, as I did Cabinet on Monday, just to explain where, what went on and where we're up to. So I'll, I'll keep it very brief, uh, and I'm happy to answer uh, a few questions at the end, if that's okay. So uh, at 9.15, or approximately 9.15 on Saturday night, there was a large explosion uh, which occurred at number one Boundary Road in New Ferry um, at the premises um, of, um, uh, well, the commercial premises that are uh, two or three organisations in there, a furniture shop, a dance studio, and a charitable organisation were based in that building. Mm -hmm. uh, the catastrophic explosion as it occurred uh, led to, uh, at the scene on the night, 34 casualties being evacuated to various hospitals uh, across the area uh, and two of those at the time were critical uh, although one has now come off the critical uh, uh, list who's a female where there were leg injuries however there was a male who is um, uh, extremely extremely poorly um, with head injuries um, um, and, and I'm not set on that he's, he's on life support at the moment. Um, it led to uh, uh, an absolutely what I would deem to be uh, an exemplary and fantastic multi-agency response not only from colleagues from the fire and police initially um, but very quickly followed up with uh, local authority and I'm pleased to say the local communities coming together to deal with what, what was uh, and can only be described as a horrendous situation at that time if you'd been in that vicinity uh, and having been somebody who's walked through that both that, that night backwards and forwards uh, it reminded me of my uh, days in the military of walking the streets of Northern Ireland about the bomb explosions in Bosnia. It really was that, that horrific. Uh, it led to the evacuation of some adjoining roads, which for those who know the area was Boundary Road, under, uh, Underlay Terrace, 
Bennington Road, uh, and there was a large cordon put in place uh, uh, to really let the emergency services get on and deal with the situation as they did, and that took quite a bit of time. Um, the council were asked to request with uh, traffic control, building control, and, and evacuation centres, and by the time I'd arrived there, which was about, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 o'clock uh, that night, um, an evacuation centre had already been opened at the Life Centre on 1A or Chester Road, and I have to say to the record chair that, uh, and, and the committee members, they were absolutely fantastic throughout all that weekend. Uh, there wasn't a question uh, asked in, in helping and assisting. And over that weekend, uh, the, the community really came together with the businesses around there, and there were donations of um, food, uh, equipment, and clothing coming in left, right, and centre to support those people who were displaced initially and, and more, more importantly those that have continued to be displaced and probably will be for some time. We are currently looking after, uh, or we were over the weekend, um, uh, 10 people in temporary accommodation. Our homelessness team uh, kicked into uh, gear really, really quickly and were able to identify emergency accommodation and, and, and those people are still in that emergency accommodation in bed and breakfast is local. Uh, because the reality is that some of those properties will never be in a fit state to turn back to and actually once the, once the structural engineers get, get the ability to move in because I need to say the record it is still being looked at as a crime scene at the moment so the police are still investigating the causes of that explosion in that area so we're really waiting on the outside and we need to let that take that course of action because if there is agencies or individuals who are called that investigation needs to take place. We're meanwhile uh, um, setting up a bit in the background under David Ball a recovery coordinating group which will start to bring all of those business representatives, the community representatives and the other agencies and services who service that area to start practically looking at what, 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 what we can do to move forward because it may still be too early to say but when instances of this occur side of, uh, or outcomes of this is it does present opportunities in terms of regeneration of areas and things of that nature once there's an ability to look at the area as we go forward. So very much setting up that coordination group under David to allow him to lead and, and facilitate some of those conversations as we start to move forward and, and, and allow that area to come to terms with what's going on. Um, the cordon by the police will continue to hopefully reduce as they, as they eliminate various bits through their investigation and as they reduce those that will allow the loss of justice, the insurance companies or our structural engineers for the number of people, it, as is often the case in some areas and certainly in areas where I've uh, had emergencies on the Wirral, it, it tends to be those members of the community that are already having a bit of a hard time in terms of their lives and properties get affected the most in this and that's very much the case in some of those areas that we're dealing with some of the most vulnerable probably in any way uh, in terms of their, their, their own individual circumstances and, and, and we've got a duty to look after those and assist those in, in whatever way we can to, 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 to allow them to, to get back to some degree of normality as quickly as possible. There's been a number of multi-agency emergency planning meetings we'd expect. They were initially led by the fire service while they dealt with that initial uh, 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 emergency with search and rescue. That was then handed over to the police and, and then there's an ACC meeting that strand of the police. Uh, we've attended those meetings and again offered our assistance to the emergency services and to other, people, other agencies as required uh, to allow them to, to get on and do the work they need to do. I've mentioned we're moving on to recovery now, Chair, and that's really where I wanted to end the, the, the briefing uh, uh, in, in terms of that, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, I know all of our thoughts are deep with those people who have been affected and injured um, by this last, and also I'd like to thank, I'm sure everyone else has been to all of those first songs who are there, and I'm going to look forward to this quick and keep the team so we can get together. Now I'm going to open the questions, Brian, with the caveat. Yeah, thank you, Chair. First of all, to thank Mark for the report, and I think it might be appropriate, Chair, for this committee to place on record its
sincere thanks to everybody who's helped in any way since the incident on Saturday night. I've heard nothing but fantastic reports about the way everybody's, you know, risen to the occasion, so perhaps we could record that in a minute. And I don't know whether Mark could give us any more details. I understand from press reports, and you've confirmed it tonight, Mark, that the police are treating it as a crime scene. Have we any idea how long it's going to be before we get any sort of results of their current investigations on that? It would be remiss of me to talk about a police investigation anyway, but certainly with police officers in the room as well. I think the investigation is a normal course of event, that if there's been an explosion of that nature, my understanding is that there would be an investigation to understand what's caused that explosion and to rule out any sort of malpractice, etc. I'm not going to comment any further than that, yeah. uh, Councillor Kenny, because I think it would be wrong to do so. Thank you. Yeah, chair, through you. Yeah, um, again, what we're, what we're really waiting on is for the is for the is for the, uh, the, the, the the blast area, if you like, to be handed over to the to, to the authority to be able to undertake those structural surveys. Now, some of those structural surveys of the properties will be undertaken by the individual property owners, own insurance companies, and loss adjusters. But there will be a number that won't be, and they'll be left to the local authority under its responsibility for dangerous structures to make an assessment on whether they're safe. And, 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 you know, you've seen the pictures on Sky and in the media, there were a number of those buildings that, you know, you, don't, you probably don't need to be a structural engineer to know that they're, they're probably going to be flattened. Chair, through you, Vermeer. As we speak, the, the constituency manager, Fergus Adams, <coughs> and David Ball are setting up a location where we'll be the, the single point of contact, if you like. So I can you, you'll have Fergus's details on the internet system anyway. So I would suggest you put them in touch that way, and, 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 and he will be able to uh, uh, direct you to where the best place to do that to make that contact. <coughs>
but obviously as well, a percentage of those will be will be insured and some won't. It's pro I don't know the exact figures, but it's it just on the type of properties, I would say it's pretty much a 50-50 split. Okay, Chris? Uh, well, I'd like to ask about um, the houses that were affected. We know the terrorist group, obviously. And Could you possibly use the microphone, please? Because I can't hear well, I think it's making a funny noise, and we've not been using this one. And also, um, the ones opposite with the other Griffiths and the like. But there doesn't seem to be any damage to the um, Lima houses, the village houses. Has there been damage to those as well? Yeah, yeah okay, Chair. Um, and again, for the councillor was very nice to it quite well. So, Boundary Road, there is a terrace of Lima fume style type houses opposite where the explosion was. They've been badly affected. So numbers two to eight in, in terms of those properties, which is rather the bet by Griffiths, if, 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 you, if you can recall some of those. There was some superficial damage far and wide, and that's why I said it very much took me back to bomb scenes in Bosnia and Northern Ireland, that as you started walking up Bevington Road under the railway bridges, the force of the explosion has broken glass and, and, and the projectiles of bricks has removed roof tiles from quite far down, as far as the Albi. Yeah. So if you go down that far, you can start to think of the size of the explosion. And, and at the other end, going upwards, really. Um, so there are a number of those ports, but we're in touch with the Ports Sunlight Trust. Um, to, to, as I said, we moved into the, we're moving into the recovery phase now. It's important to point out that just on a governance arrangement that the incidents of this multi-agency dimension and scale, they need to go through a number of processes for governance and there needs to be an official handover from the police to the local authority to start taking uh, steps on recovery in that governance terms. But all the partners are well aware and have started to work on the recovery plans behind the scenes. Uh, it just takes time to put it in order. And, I do say, Chair and, and, and members, because we are really, really uh, uh, well aware of the important role that elected members and ward councillors take in terms of that community reassurance. And I ask for just patience, and I have spoke to all the ward councillors, that, that, that it requires a little bit of patience to just allow the investigation to be taken and actually for the recovery coordinating group to be set up. And once that's set up, it will, I am sure, reap far greater benefits than lots of local groups setting up in, in an ad hoc way. And I, I don't mean that in a control way, but it's important that we do coordinate it and that the council seem to be coordinated in, in that approach. Can I just come back and say, I was very pleased yesterday when I was with Fergus and Shannon, who were South constituency officers of our office, um, and they were already under David Ball getting everything set up for the move on to the future, which I think is what people need. And I have to echo what you said, because one of my sons, who's not pleasing, uh, who is army, and my husband who's ex-army, uh, they both thought sitting in my house it was a bomb. And we're quite used to awful noises coming from levers. And we were, everybody in the road went out because we thought one of the levers chimneys had gone up again. And we're half a mile away and our house is shook. So how those people must be feeling. One of our colleagues, one of, one of the Labour councillors, actually lives in Boundary Road. So it's, it, it's had repercussions. Those people must be very badly affected, really, when they start thinking about the way it's all going right now. Thanks, Jen. Um, Adam asked the question I was going to ask. Now, my concern is about the people, and there will be people there who are not in shore. Um, so I drop stuff off at the Light Church. As soon as you've got somewhere, because toiletries are in desperate need, I heard on the local radio today on Merseyside, and clothing, there were people on Merseyside saying they're still standing up in, in the clothes <coughs> that they were, they were evacuated out of the premises on, on Saturday night. So as soon as you know and we coordinate where we can all drop stuff off from, will you please let all the members know? So any, any clothing, toiletries, let us know what people are absolutely desperate for so that we can start as members and asking people in our own wards would they be kind enough um, to donate. So as soon as that's coordinated, Mark, can you let us know as soon as possible, please? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just Chair, through you. Uh, Councillor Sullivan, you're exactly right. I, 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 think, I think the, 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 the issue is a very 
practical issue. The, 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 the offer of support from far and wide and the community and, and businesses has been fantastic. The issue is that we've got some families that are literally in rooms in bed and breakfasts and, and, and actually it's about the next stage so the quicker we can make an assessment on their property, get them into some temporary accommodation for a more medium term rather than short term, then actually I think that's the time. But I actually, speaking to Fergus and David, they are setting up a, a facility I think uh, it, well, I know they are in, in New Ferry. As soon as that address is out, I'm sure we'll get that out to all councillors and there will be um, uh, information on where things can be dropped off. Can I just come back with a supplementary very quickly, Chair, because a lot of time's moving on. There are people who, there was a young couple on Merseyside today who were actually sleeping on the floor in the chap's sisters. So are we making every effort? I'm sure we are. To get hold of these people, you know, because they won't be the only ones and they said they, they were running away, they said people were running towards the explosion to see what they could do. And they were in shock, the young lady was in shock. But they're sleeping on the floor in the chap's sisters. These are people we need to get to as quickly as we can. I know it's difficult, I know it's difficult. Chair, again, through you, you're absolutely right. That's why the appeal went out on Radio Merseyside again today to ask people to come forward. There's telephone numbers for them to contact. They're either the daytime telephone number through the council's normal switchboard or the, the, or the EDT team out of hours. The police are still running their contact centre in terms of people as well. And in terms of the mental health trust, etc., we know there's going to be latent effects to this of people who might be psychologically traumatised, where actually some of that comes later on rather than the initial you know, time. So the, the, the services are aware, they're working on plans, they're getting that information out there. And, and really, it is, it is a case of if you if you know anybody, if anybody knows, then get them to make contact with us because we we, we think we, we we we've got the ones that have got the most affected properties, and there may be people sleeping outside, not knowing that their properties come back into actually they can use it. And obviously, what we've got to situation is that as we remove that cord and back, what we're very keen to do is do that with the property owner or the resident there to be able to say, well, there's your house back, and it, you know we think it's habitable. Or we can't find that residence and we're bored of it or making it secure. So that's very much the approach we're going through. So the appeals out there, I think uh, Councillor Sullivan, that we need to make it and continue making it. Okay, fine. Just very quick, Marsh just touched on actually about the mental health issues afterwards, obviously, as Christine and yourself have said.
based around that. The idea is the order will allow members to be more informed as to what's going on locally and how that may impact upon the council strategy moving forward. So the idea is that let us drill down into one subject before taking our usual agenda items. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, okay. Um, well, thanks for having me. I've been, uh, first of all, I'm in Hassel Local Police and Command of the Royal Order. Um, I've been asked um, to come and give a bit of an overview about the um, restructure of the Mersey Cycles that took place um, at the end of um, second the second back program. Uh, the restructure that took place at the end of uh, January this year, which was on the back of um, the impact of the comprehensive spending review and also the necessity to look at you know, making some efficiencies in the way we were uh, delivering our business. So I did a presentation in January to um, probably um, a number of elected members and um, a bit of a question and answer session to, to allow them to get an understanding of, of what community policing would look like post implementation. And some of the slides of this, it's only a relatively short presentation, but uh, I've kept the context in because I wasn't sure of the, of the audience tonight and, and who had actually seen that presentation. So, it might be a little bit of a whistle stop, but hopefully I'll give you the opportunity to ask further questions if required. So this is the backdrop to the um, implementation of the changes, which um, we brought a, a project together called uh, Community First, which is Chief Constable Andy Cook's uh, vi vision about putting the community in the heart of everything that we do. Um, the financial picture, obviously since 2010, has been really impactful to us. And we've saved close on £78 million pounds and uh, you know, had to reduce the workforce by around 1,500 officers and staff. And if you recall back to December 2015 when the uh, announcement around the comprehensive, comprehensive spending review was taking place, in the run up to that, we expected to be further quite deep cuts in it during this period. Um, however, at the time, there had been a number of terrorist attacks in Europe. And um, pretty much out of the blue for us, the Chancellor came forward and indicated uh, that there wouldn't be any further cuts in um, policing when, when the, uh, the announcement was made. So at that time, it probably it certainly didn't, we didn't feel it was going to be as deep as £48 million, pounds, but uh, we did set up a, a project team to have a look at the implications. And some of the issues that were being um, discussed at the time was around this turnaround protected budget because the reality is there were also commitments to that about putting an uplift in our firearms capability so should we have the likes of marauding terrorist attack the sorts of things we've seen in Europe that would be, we would be far better positioned to respond to that type of events but there wasn't going to be any additional funding um, that was going to be given to that so we had to come from within the existing budgets and then within the context of obviously um, inflation and pay awards that exist within um, the organisation. Uh, the reality was we were still going to have to uh, make savings. We also, every force had to look uh, at putting a proportion of its budget into a transformational fund um, and that was built into police reform legislation and the forces could bid back into that fund to demonstrate what they were doing around making further efficiencies. So initially we were working on the presumption that we were probably going to have to save somewhere in the region of uh, close on 40, 47 and a half, 40 a million pounds. That was then revised based on what I just mentioned there to around 25 million pounds worth of further savings <coughs> on top of the 78 million pounds we've made so far in, in, in this um, tranche which will you know, lead us up to 2020. So the project team um, came up with a number of different business cases um, and looked at the way the organisation was, was set up and well, in my 26 years service, we, other than the implementation of neighbourhood policing back in around 2001, we haven't had any significant structural change. We've very much been based around what we term basic command units, so the world was one of our um, six basic command units at the time. Although in recent times we've moved to five because Liverpool, with the size of it, have been two separate units, we've actually uh, merged them. So we have that sort of 
coterminous footprint with our local authority and other strategic partners. And it was always headed by an area, an area commander who had the budget and the resources within their, within their gift. Um, and out of the, the uh, project options, um, it was decided that actually we had to move towards a, a functional model of policing. And these were the headed titles of those functions. The main ones that actually impact the service delivery in general terms on the will are the first three. Um, in, in, with regards to response and resolution, that is about our emergency response to 999 calls. The investigation, as it sounds, is our CID and protecting vulnerable people and um, dealing with domestic in, uh, abuse and, and follow investigations, child protection um, issues. And then local policing was the, the, the global term that we were going to give to our new iteration of naval policing. And um, we, we were quite keen not to keep the term naval because actually community policing was more than just the geographical location because it might be faith communities, it might be uh, particular minority groups, etc. We're very keen to get a better understanding of what our communities look like. So, the way we're set up now, um, we still have a significant level of resource uh, on the web. Um, we have our response and resolution elements um, answering our 999 calls. Um, and uh, obviously any um, demand that is requiring a police, a, a police attendance. As mentioned, we've got investigations dealing with uh, protecting the vulnerable people. We've got our local um, community policing teams, which instead of being um, in four separate locations across the borough, are now actually in two locations. That being Bevington, which was refurbished and relaunched as a, as a, a community police station, and Wallasey. Uh, and I also have responsibility for what, what we call our targeted policing team who will do things like execute warrants for us, track down fugitives for us, um, they, they have you know, plain clothes capability, etc, etc. We have a lot of issues around the likes of um, scene management and I'm dealing with const, what we call CONOPS, constant observations. So if we take somebody who's either arrested or vulnerable to hospital because that's the right place for them to be, um, if they are under arrest or detained under mental health legislation, we have to rem remain with them until they're assessed properly. So, um, restructure-wise, what the, the savings that were made were by cutting out a significant proportion of the management structure. So, this, uh, I am the local um, policing commander uh, for the Wirral. I have responsibility for the, uh, the community policing teams um, and the targeted policing team. Um, and, and I have leadership responsibility over our response to um, you know, emergency calls and to investigation, but I don't have the budgetary responsibility. That's now a central function uh, under, under a central command. Um, I put questions there, but I think that's also an opportunity just to mention um, some of the benefits and some of the challenges, really, because this is a whistle stop tour, just really to put it into context probably the next agenda item around what we're trying to do with the partnership and um, to develop some of, some of our um, community um, intervention and early health working. Some of the benefits we've had is um, we broke down our borders historically. The patrols responding to 999 on the wheel stayed on the wheel, but equally they stayed in the pool. I knew as the policing commander that our demands required more policing resource time and we now regularly get police get patrols coming through the tunnel um, to us to respond to calls. <clears throat> I think there was obviously some worry that we might provide everything to Liverpool, but that's not being borne out. And, and, it's, and it's based around just the volume of calls that we get, and there's a lot of historical data as to why that, may, why, why that might be the case. We've got improved governance around um, particularly protecting vulnerable people. They've come under one command, and we have a series of strategic governance forums where the, the head of crime um, holds to account uh, every area across the force and what they're doing and we try and have a consistent footprint uh, around the delivery of our service. We've got free daily movements of resources and obviously we've just spoken there about the blast 
years ago. Um, we've got um, other incidents ongoing today that just are impacting our resource. So we're able to now bid into the central teams and ask for resources to come over and support us on the lower world, cutting our ability to respond to emergencies down. From a community policing point of view, it's a good news story for us is whilst we have gone to two points, we haven't vastly reduced the uh, budgeted posts in those areas of business. And you know, it, it amazes me every day when I see our, on a daily basis we have their feedback sheets as to what's gone on, the, you know, significant events over the last 24 hours. And we've had some really good news stories, particularly around some of antisocial behaviour issues, which I fully accept they come in ways that they come at different times of the year, seasonal issues. But we've had some really good feedback from the North End of the Head around some of the partnership activity that we've put in with the antisocial behaviour team, uh, community patrol, and obviously I'm sure that will form part of the next presentation. Only, the, only two days ago, a resident from Northern Street sent me a really nice email about all the work that the local community policing team have been involved with all the agencies and the community working with the community to reduce some of the issues that have been going on for the, you know, the last sort of six to twelve months. And, and it gives us an opportunity really to look forward and continue to you know, develop our approach around partnership working. I think when we look back to 2001, the implementation of neighbourhood policing was the kick of our backside to make sure that we did work within the continent, the, the spirit of the crime disorder act, and we really looked at working in partnership. But actually, we realise now the demands that have been placed on us and all the other agent part, uh, public services, um, the implications of you know, shrinking budgets, and how we look to get in to much earlier phase to make sure that we haven't got that significant. Once you, once you get into the statutory elements. So that, that's a real benefit for us. Challenges wise, you know, I can't stand here and say, you know, everything's going to be rosy in, 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 in the forthcoming years because we all know we've still got to make further savings. And, you know, an organisation such as ours, the public service, it is people that are going to make this, you know, you know, going to be the savings. So we've got to think smarter and smarter and work together to actually overcome those uh, challenges. We've implemented our model at a period of time in the organisation where unfortunately we've had a significant increase in gun crime, particularly injury discharges, and we did have that in Wallasey, and that has led, us, led to us having to resource a number of disruption plans, which is in addition to what we would normally have around our daily business, and that's been really impactful. And then of course we have a major instance such as through the weekend, you know, we're, we're constantly, it, it ends up costing you, we're constantly having to bring uh, pe people in, working like, extended hours. But, but as I said, you know, um, the good thing is we've got really strong partnership um, relationships with um, the public sector, with um, whether it be the local authority, whether it be health, you know, and, and all the um, variety of departments within the local authority, and, and I, I see a lot of good benefits sitting around the table and trying to develop the partnership models that we've got in order to, to say get in and, and provide that early intervention as soon as possible. So that's it really Chair with regards to where we could be are and I'm going to take some questions and then start with some quick questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> pardon me, I see Mike immediately so can we go ahead Mike?
activity, at a scene, speaking to someone, get them to electronically update things, does take things out of, that I suppose if you were to do a time and motion process around the inefficiency that we did have. So there is opportunities always in processes to, to, to keep on saving and drawing a little bit out. But I recognise what, what you're saying. We will always be able to respond to an emergency incident or we always um, our critical mass is based around um, national levels of, of responding to uh, major incidents. We will always have the ability to call on other resources. But there comes a point where on a day-to-day -day basis where as an organisation we have to prioritize in different levels of the organisation, we have to look at what is our greatest threats. What's the greatest risk of harm that we've got? Now, for most families as a whole, and this is not necessarily reflective of the will, it's, it's gun crime. But, but the Police and Crime Commissioner sets a number of strategic priorities of which every one of the boroughs um, will look to try and deliver against those. And the nature of policing has changed over the years. So, um, you know, certainly when we talk about cyber crime, whether it be cyber enabled crime, you know, a lot of what we would have had as public order offences, potentially harassment offences, because people were um, shouting or calling names in the streets or heard abuses done by social media, whether it be Facebook or an app, or WhatsApp or something else, something else. So we've had to start to adapt to try and respond to that. And, and I think we've used this analogy before, within the investigation strand, 